I want to begin the final part of our four-part series called Everyday Disciple with a question. It's a question Jesus is going to ask us. And the question is, are you good for nothing? No, seriously, I'm asking you. Are you good for nothing? That's in essence what what Jesus is going to ask in a moment. And if you know anything about the ministry of Jesus, he's always good at asking rhetorical questions. And a rhetorical question is a question that you ask to another person where you know the answer to it already, but you want the person to know the answer to it. And rhetorical questions can be good, but in the wrong context, uh, they can be pretty painful. Uh, Years ago when my boys were little, they probably still in diapers, Candy and I were in Chattanooga, and uh, I woke up in the morning like I normally do, and I got out the cereal from the pantry, and I poured a bowl of cereal, went to the refrigerator, and uh, went and grabbed the milk, and when I unscrewed the top, I realized that the milk was empty. To which I turned to my wife, and I said, Candy, do you have any idea who drank the rest of the milk? Now, that moment in the home, there were two babies who couldn't even reach the refrigerator. (laughs) And there were two adults. And Candy, in uh, the kindest way she could, just stared at me. And I never asked that question again, I promise you. I knew the answer to that question already, right? So rhetorical questions the wrong way are not good. But Jesus knows how to ask rhetorical questions in a way that causes us to think. And that's what he's going to do today. He's gonna use two metaphors, light, and he's gonna use salt. And he's gonna use those in a way to see how we are influencing the world or not. And I want you to just kind of give you a little, back. I wanna give you a backstory before we begin. We're, we've been talking for a couple of weeks about the mission of our church. The mission is we want you to live out your God-given calling as you follow Jesus and make disciples every day. And the last four or three weeks and this week is basically ways you can live this out before the world. We talked three weeks ago about being a spirit-led follower of God, right? We wanna be filled with the spirit of God. Two weeks ago, we talked about being an intentional friend. By the way, if you hadn't listened to any of these messages, uh, let me encourage you to go back and just see how you can live this mission statement out. Last week, we talked about being a humble guide. And what that means, it means, and it's not having all the answers or being the best disciple maker. It's admitting that you will mess up, but you're going to continue to try. Today is the final trait, and that is how can we, watch this, be a force for good in the world? How can we be a force for good? Now, Jesus is gonna show us this in Matthew chapter five, verse 12, and he's gonna give us two metaphors, and then he's gonna put this on us at the end. So Matthew chapter five, verse 13, if you're there, you can say word. I like to say word at Long Hollow. We've got one person. (laughs) Are you there? You can say word. If you're at home, you can say word as well because we enjoy studying the word. We know it's impactful, amen? Verse 13, Jesus is talking to the disciples, although the crowd is listening. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I wanna give you three questions to drive our conversation. Number one is this, what is, write this down if you're taking notes, what is salt good for? What is salt good for? Now, there's a lot of things salt is good for. I looked up different websites and different uh, commentaries and they would say there's probably 15 uses of salt. One said 20 uses of salt. One said 40 uses. Let me give you just a handful. Uh, Salt, and, and by the way, Jesus is using salt as a metaphor for how we as Christians should season and flavor and impact the world, right? So first of all, we know salt is a preservative. Uh, In the ancient world, they didn't have deep freezers and refrigerators or coolers. And so in order to make the meat last longer, they would put salt on it 
and it would kill the bacteria. The second thing salt does is it flavors. And if you're like me, you put salt on food before you even taste it. Anybody with me, right? And that's actually offensive to the cook. Who knew? <laughs> Until Candy told me one day, right? So, uh, but I love salt, right? It flavors. Number three, salt will sting. Why? Because when salt comes in contact with an open wound, it stings, and so should the Christian at times to a lost world, right? And then finally, and this is a big one, salt creates thirst. Uh, if you eat salt, you become thirsty, and we as Christians should make people thirsty for God. But the question we need to ask is this. What did Jesus mean when he asked the question, can salt lose its saltiness? And I want you to think about the answer. Do you think, don't, don't say it out loud, do you think that salt can lose its saltiness? Well, the context helps us. In, in the first century, they would get their salt from the Dead Sea. And if you're interested in going to Israel, believe it or not, we've been behind the scenes, been trying to get my back right so we can travel again next year to Israel. If anybody's interested, we used to go every year and we just haven't done it. But uh, anybody interested in going to Israel next year? Maybe. Okay. Uh, life-changing. But anyway, when we go to the Dead Sea, you'll see that this is a, a, a sea that is unusable as far as swimming and drinking, but it has salt, a high salt content. 20% uh, is salt. And so they mine the salt out of there, and every now and then there are minerals and gypsum and other contaminants that will find themselves in the bag of salt that is on your table. And so what do you do with a contaminated bag of salt? Do you eat it? No. You throw it out. Now, you throw it out in a particular fashion. You just don't walk out to the garden and dump this bag of salt in the garden. Why? Because it kills the plants. You don't throw it in the grass because it kills the lawn. So what you do, which Jesus says, you throw it on the path or the ground and you trample on it. The question Jesus is asking is, can salt lose its saltiness? And the answer is what? No. No, it can't. But it can, you're gonna love this, but it can be distilled, it can be watered down, it can be diluted with contaminants. Now, what does it have to do with us in the Christian life? Watch this. <laughs> Jesus says we are the salt of the earth, but we lose, Christian, listen to me, the influence we have when sin creeps in. We lose the impact we have when transgression creeps in. We lose the, 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 the way we're impacting those in our family when, when disobedience slips in our life. So I want you to look at your life. And let me ask you a couple questions as it connects with salt. Are you salty? Somebody saying, yeah, my, my, my spouse is very critical. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that kind of salty, okay? I'm not talking about salty here in the front. It's back away. Now, I'm not talking about that kind of salt. I'm talking about are you seasoning? Watch this. How do you taste to those around you? Do you spice up the lives of those who are in your vicinity to Christ, or do you lead them away? Are you creating a thirst for God? Are you watering down the gospel with your life or are you adding to the gospel and furthering the gospel with your influence? Here's the question. If you aren't doing that, then your life, like, like salt, is good for nothing. That's what Jesus says, good for nothing. The same question is, what is light good for? What is light good for? Again, a lot of things, I'll give you three. First of all, light is good for warning someone of danger. Go to a railroad crossing, what do you see flashing? Lights, there could be danger here. Light also is a guide, right? If you have a flashlight, it guides you on a path. But the cool thing about light, and I thought about it, kind of an overarching theme, light, watch this, is meant to be seen. I mean, that's why we have light, it's meant to be seen. The purpose of light is to shine in darkness. And wouldn't you agree, we live in a dark world and we as the light of Christ should be reflecting to the world. Now don't miss this. We are not the light, just to remind you of this. Like the moon reflects the sun, without the sun, the moon has no light to shine. And we as Christians, we don't emit light from ourselves, we're actually reflections of Christ shining off our life to the world. But the question again is this, what did Jesus mean? When he said, no one lights a basket or a light and puts it under a basket. 
In the first century, this is gonna surprise some of you, you could not go to Target or Target if you're classy, right? You go to Target. <laughs> My sister calls it Target, right? Go to Target if you're classy. Now, you couldn't go to Home Goods, right? You couldn't go to Hobby Lobby. And so what you did is you had a bowl filled with oil and you had a floating wick that would go on top. Now, you can imagine, it was very difficult to get this moving target lit in a bowl full of oil. I mean, that was a lot of work. And so eventually, when you finally get the lamp lit and there's light in the house, what is the last thing you're going to do? When the, lamp, when the light is finally shining, what's the light? you're not going to put it under a basket, one, because it could go out, but two, it's not doing, don't miss this, what it was created to do. It's in a sense wasted. Friends, don't miss this. Once Jesus illuminates your life by salvation and he turns the lights on for you, the worst thing you could do is to hide the light from the world. See, our purpose is to radiate the light of Christ. And so let me ask you a couple of questions. Are you reflecting the light of Christ to those around you? Are you warning people of the impending danger that's coming of a life separated from Christ for eternity? Or are you hiding the light? Are you covering it? If so, like light, you would be good for nothing. Some of you may have noticed online, there has been a shortage of woodworking pictures <laughs> posted on Instagram. You may, some of you may have noticed that. And it's not for lack of, of trying in the Gallaty Woodshop Incorporated uh, at home. Uh, it, it's just that I've decided to take woodworking in a different direction, just to be honest with you. Uh, I've decided that I mean, I've made some tables and I've, I've made some bookshelves and I've made uh, some coffee tables and I've made a desk and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna try to make something new. And so I have been kind of behind the scenes working on epoxy poor wooden electric guitars. And some of you are saying, what? I was telling Candy this yesterday morning. She says, our people must really think you are something, Robbie. I mean, really. I mean, who has a pastor that just wakes up one day, says, I want to make an epoxy river pour wooden guitar for fun. And uh, some of you may say, well, why guitars? I, I started playing guitar when I was 11 uh, after I saw the movie La Bamba. Can I get an amen? Anybody remember? That was a good movie. That was a good movie. So there's a race like me in the 90s. I mean, that was a good movie. I went back and watched the movie again with the boys all excited. Note to self, you may want VidAngel. But anyway, <laughs> so I decided, you know, like I learned anything. What do I do? I went to the YouTube University and I watched hours and hours of epoxy videos. And so I started learning about this epoxy and, you know, as so I'm like ready to go. And so Guitar Build 1.0 started great. I mean, the pour was perfect. I could not believe how good the pour was. And so here was the pour. I mean, it looked great. It had a river down the middle. It was a metallic red. And I decided, you know, the guitar needs a cut, like a cutaway in the body. And so I made a jig for my bandsaw and I made the back cut, which looked perfect to me. I was really excited. And then I turned it over to make the front cut. And I realized after, right after I made it, it's on the wrong side. <laughs> That's like the wrong side, which produced this kind of, uh, width of the guitar, <laughs> which is completely useless. So 1.0 was thrown out, and then I moved on to Guitar Build 2.0, and this one I was determined to get right. And so this one, I poured the epoxy again, perfect. I couldn't believe it. I mean, this would even look better. I thought, you know what? Sometimes you gotta make mistakes to get to where God really wants you. This one's gonna be better. The river was perfect. The cuts in the body came out flawless. I moved on to the router, and who knew? The router was possessed when I picked it. I don't know how. I don't know how. This thing had a mind of its own. Yeah. And that's what it produced. And I threw it in the garbage after that. And so now I had two useless guitars. And so this is Guitar Build 3.0. Okay? 3.0. And I was bound and determined this time that this one was going to be right. And so I took my time. I decided to pour a clear epoxy this time. You can kind of see it in there. A clear epoxy in the guitar. I thought, man, this is even better than the first two. I went ahead and routed all the pieces, the pickup guards, where the knobs go. I went ahead and took my time, came out perfect. 
I went ahead and cut the, to cut the uh, bandsaw cutaways. They were perfect. I decided to paint it with six coats of clear gloss lacquer. Came out perfect. Brought it in the shop. Sanded this thing down to 7,000 grit sandpaper, which you know goes from 150 to 300 to 500 to 700 to 1,000. I mean, that's the deal. It took me like three hours to sand it. I went ahead and buffed it for another three hours. It was flawless. And then I went to put the bridge in right here. And when I put the bridge in, I turned it over. The bridge stood up about one half inch taller than the width of the guitar. And at that moment, I realized I had three paperweights <laughs> that I would have to sell for $150 each because of the epoxy inside of them. I mean, what am I gonna do? Now, I did learn in the meantime, they're great Bible holders. If you just open your Bible, they do, they do. And if anybody interested, you can eat, just send me a private message on Instagram, I'll sell it. No, the problem with this is this, you know this. It really looks good, you have to admit. I mean, I was impressed with it. The craftsmanship, you're like, wow, that's really good. It looks impressive. Wow, look at, look, look at the way you work this thing out. It's, it looks like a masterpiece. The problem is this. Even though this guitar has great potential, this guitar, like the other two, is good for nothing unless it's played. <laughs> See, unless the guitar does what it was created to do, it is essentially good for nothing. You wanna know what the greatest tragedy is in your life? Listen to me. The greatest tragedy for you would be to live and to die and not know what purpose you are here for. And sadly, it happens all over the world. People live and die and they never know what they're good for, which is the third question. The question is, what are you good for? What are you good for? Jesus said, in the same way as I made the connection, light shines, salt preserves, flavors, season. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they see your good works and give glory to who? Give glory to God. Let me show you the passage, a pretty interesting insight here. In the same way, let whose light shine? your light shine so that people see whose good works? Your good works and give glory to who? Your Father. See, what he's saying here is, you and I were created for good works. Now, when you hear force for good, the natural, the natural thought process is, well, I'm supposed to like witness to the lost. That's what it means. I'm supposed to help the poor. I'm supposed to minister to the sick. Yeah, all those things are important, but it's way simpler than that. In fact, what I would submit to you is this. Jesus had in mind something so close and so near that it's easy to overlook. Why? Because what Jesus has in mind is looking at your skill set, your ability, your talents, and figuring out how you can use them to advance the gospel and bring people to him. Friends, listen to me. The greatest ministry opportunity, I want you to get this. The greatest ministry opportunity in your life is right in front of you. For example, how many people in here would say, I like to fish? Anybody? Anybody like to fish? Anybody say, I would try to fish? Raise your hand high. Okay. Next time you're out on a boat or out on the land, let's say you're on the boat and you're out fishing. Look for divine appointments where you can share the gospel with those in the, bo in the boat. God knows you're not catching anything. See, you, you might as well just talk about something, right? Let's be honest, if you're on old hickory, nothing. Uh, if you're a young person in here, listen to me. When you're on the Oculus, when you're playing Fortnite or you're playing Gorilla Tag or Call of Duty, listen to me. There are people that God is bringing all over the world on the metaverse that you would never see in church. Look for opportunities for gospel conversations to advance the gospel. If you're a barber or a hairstylist in here, and you sit in a chair, or so you gotta think about this. When people come to you, they are in your chair for 45 minutes, right? Or three and a half hours when my wife goes to get her hair done, which I've never, I've never figured that out. Anybody with me? Like, I know my hair is a big deal, but I mean, I can get out in 45 minutes. I'm like, hey, babe, when are you coming home? After lunch. What? You've been there since eight. Anybody with me? 
I never understand it. I never understand it. But listen, if you're a hairstylist or a barber, use that to advance the God. I mean, pray, God, give me an opportunity to talk about you. If you're a salesman on a sales call, before you walk in every call, before you pick up every phone, you say, God, would you give me an opportunity to tell this man or woman about you? Friends, listen, getting people to come to church is a great endeavor. But what's even greater is the front line of ministry called your everyday life. I mean, I think we've made ministry so complicated today, right? I mean, we, we think it's complicated. We say, like, if I'm not on pastoral staff at Long Hollow, then I can't do ministry. If I ain't got, I mean, once I go to seminary and then I come back, I can do ministry. Or uh, if I'm not on the mission field, then I then definitely can't do ministry. But the reality is, you and I have a mission field right in front of our faces. Did you know what the, great, you know what the greatest mission field is? What is your greatest mission field? Do you know what it is? The office you work at. I mean, think how cool God is. God decides to bring every day of the week people from all over the city to your business where they're stuck there for eight hours and they can't go anywhere if they want to make a living, right? They're stuck there, and you get an opportunity to pray, and God use you to advance his kingdom. What about the gym? Anybody go to the gym in the morning or the afternoon? Anybody at the gym need to hear about Jesus? Anybody? Use that as an opportunity. Maybe you go to the dojo, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, or uh, Jeet Kune Do, or Taekwondo, or any other kwandos, you, you can use that for the gospel. If you're out playing disc golf with the disc golf crew, which by the way, the long haul disc golf crew is getting so big, we're taking applications. But anyway, if you're playing disc golf, for example, right? Some of you are like, what are you talking? If you're playing disc golf, then you talk about Jesus or regular golf for that matter. If you go to school, young people, listen to me. God, it's no accident. I love this. I tell my kids, that. it's no accident that the boys and girls who are directly positioned around you in class, it's not by happenstance, it's a sovereign plan of God to put them there. And the question is, are you gonna use that as a platform to advance the gospel? It's the neighborhood you live in. It's the club you belong to. Young people, it's the summer that God's given you this year. Here's what I want you to think about. Very sobering thought. Every day, every person in this place and online preaches a sermon. Not just one, probably many, but, but at least one. Every day, every person preaches a sermon. So let me ask you, how impactful was the last sermon you just preached? What kind of impact did it have? Well, you, what are you talking about, right? I'm not, a, I'm not the pastor of the church. I don't preach. In fact, I don't even like getting in front of people. What are you talking about? I'm not talking about with your lips, although that's part of it. I'm asking you, what kind of sermon are you preaching with your life? See, because people watch us all the time. They watched how you were in an unhurried fashion able to stop and help someone who had a need. There were people watching that, I promise you. People watched how you responded to anger at the workplace with kindness, but they also watched you at the basketball or football game lose your mind in the stands over the ref. So let me ask you, what kind of sermon, brother, sister, what kind of sermon are you preaching every day? Bill Stafford was a contemporary of Ron Dunn, Manly Beasley, Peter Lord, Jack Taylor, some of the greats. And he was actually a member of my church at Brainerd for a couple of years. They called him Wild Bill Stafford. Wild Bill. Anybody heard of Wild Bill Stafford? Great evangelist. He used to have this line, your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. I mean, that's true, right? Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. You tell me what you believe, that's fine. I'll watch how you live and I'll tell you what you believe. And I love what Jesus says here. He doesn't say, listen, please, please, guys, can you start being the salt of the earth? He doesn't say that. This is a great insight. He doesn't say, listen, would you please turn on the light and start shining for once, please? He doesn't say that. What does he say? You are the salt of the earth. 
You are the light of the world. What he's saying is we're all shining and we're all salty. The question is, what kind of taste is in the mouth of those around you? How bright are you shining to those in your vicinity? A verse we use through this series is is Ephesians 2.10. I I need to come back to it because it's really a great passage about good works. And in the context, it's talking about salvation and God drawing us from sin and transgression and being wrath under the wrath of God. And then he gets to this passage after salvation and he says, for we are his workmanship. Now I've told you this before, but this word workmanship is the Greek word poema, where we get the English word what? Poem. But a better translation is the word masterpiece. I like masterpiece. And so the text is saying something that some people in here, you you need to hear this. For we are God's masterpiece. Who's God's masterpiece? We are the body of Christ. Isn't that amazing to think? Listen, God doesn't make mistakes. We are his masterpiece. To do what? Created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Now this is the brain bender which God prepared ahead in eternity past so that we should walk in them today. Pretty, pretty amazing, right? Why do I say that? I want you to know that when God formed you, he created a masterpiece. He didn't make a mistake. And, and what that means is you can turn to your neighbor right now and say this, say, say this with me. I am a work of art. I mean, seriously, turn to him now and say, I am a work of art, right? And they would say back to you, oh, sure, yes, you are, my friend. (laughs) You definitely are (laughs) a work of art, right? And thank God there's only one of you. But here's the reality. Listen, God doesn't make mistakes, right? You are gifted by God. You are equipped by God. Every person in here is unique and wonderfully made. And here's my charge of the whole sermon. Stop trying to be somebody else. You be the best you that God created you to be, amen? Stop trying to find your worth on social media. And I'm telling you, when I stop, I probably shouldn't go. (laughs) I gave up social media years ago in the revival, but the only thing I post now are pictures of woodworking disasters and finished products. I mean, that's all I do now. And then pictures of my dogs and family. Because I knew if I got on there and scrolled endlessly, my heart's condition would be sucked into comparison. And the Lord showed me, and friends, listen, I'm telling you, one of the greatest things giving up social media, I did it for over a year, didn't look one time, the greatest freeing things. Why? Because social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, it is a breeding ground for bitterness. And here's what it does, consciously or subconsciously, it creates this idea where I have to be like them. You may not say it, but as you're flipping, that's what your mind says. Why don't I have her looks? Why don't I have his skills? Why don't I have that man's ability? Why don't I have their favor? Why isn't God blessing me like that? Why don't I have that talent? And what happens is it paralyzes your usefulness for God. And what we do in response is this. We put on these artificial, synthetic representations of ourself online to impress other people. Is that accurate? Is that accurate? Because that's what I do. And so we embellish things at times because we wanna keep up with the Joneses, we wanna keep up with it. So we wanna post to impress. And I'm here to tell you, listen to me, everybody in the world is vying for you to be different. God says, don't, you be you. I created you one of a million, of a trillion. There's no one like you in the world. And so when you aren't you, it impacts the world negatively. Aren't you glad There's only one you in the world. My parents are saying, thank you, God, (laughs) right? They know me. They're like, thank God. But the reality is, listen to me. What what am I getting at? There's only one person like you, coming close, who has your parents, your upbringing, your talents, your schooling, your education, your abilities, your setbacks, your struggles, your losses, and your testimony. And so for you to not be you, you do a disservice to the kingdom. And so here's what life is, watch this. 
Life is, I'm trying to figure out how God wired me and what he created me to do. I could use a lot of illustrations in our church of this. I'm, I could use Scott Batson with Get Strong Ministries. I could use Full Count, a lot of the guys uh, in our church. with. I could use a lot of illustrations, but I want to use one you may not know. It's of a man named Aaron Walker. Aaron Walker is a good friend of mine, and I feel like he embodies what I'm talking about of being a force for good. Aaron Walker has been a very successful businessman through the years. In fact, he started and sold uh, three businesses. His wife, Robin, said he's retired three times, and this is it. No more retiring, Aaron, you know, no more. And uh, he decided after this last time of retiring that he had a passion to see men grow and develop to be not only successful businessmen, but also be, be uh, uh, men who love their wives as Christ loved the church, men who invested in their kids, men who left a difference and a legacy in the world. And so he started to coach a group of men. And over the process of coaching a group of men, he created this cohort system, high accountability, high challenge. They met once a week and he started with a few people now, uh, Big A as we call him, has over hundreds and hundreds of men from all over the world that he speaks into their lives. And here's what's cool, he'll tell you this. He said, I impact more people for Christ in this realm than I've ever done prior in my entire life. Why? Because he shows them, you wanna be a better leader? You gotta know Jesus first. You wanna be a better husband? It starts with a relationship with Christ. You wanna be a better father? It starts with a relationship with Christ. And so he's seen people saved and drawn to Jesus through this cohort mastermind. What's amazing about his life is he's figured out what he's wired to do and he has used it for, or as a force for good, and he's gonna leave an impact, friends, listen, a legacy on the life of men and women for years and years to come. If you ask Big A about his work, he stops you and says, no, I don't work. He said, I don't work a day in my life because I get up every day loving what I get to do. Friends, let me ask you, do you know what your God-given calling is in life? One of the greatest tragedies is to live and die and not know what your purpose is. Every person is made on purpose for a purpose. And so I wanna give you two questions, diagnostic questions. And these are not just Robbie thought these up, you know, yesterday. This is like, this is like 15 months of a process to get to these two crucial diagnostic, helpful, applicable questions that we can ask on a daily basis. Am I being a force for good? Number one is this. How am I living out my God-given calling? Not the calling of your mom that she thinks you should do. Not the calling of your older sibling, which you're trying to follow in their footsteps. Not to outdo the Joneses down there. What is your unique, one-of-a-kind, God-given calling? And if you know it, are you living it out? Number two, how am I leaving a legacy that matters? I said this before, one of the greatest fears in life I have is to succeed at things that have no eternal significance. To be the best at something that matters little to nothing in eternity. Now we just finished uh, a couple of weeks ago, our Discover Your Calling course. We had 130 people go through the course, start to finish, and we're gonna do it again in the fall. And so you can keep uh, a lookout for that. You can do it in person and you can do it online. So if you're online, you don't even live in Hendersonville, you could do it online as well. And uh, it's a way for us to help you figure out why God created you. I want us to pray. And I really wanna give you an opportunity here as we close, because I really feel like some of you are saying, man, I hear a sermon like this and I'm really, I'm really challenged because I feel like kind of I wasted most of my life. Just kind of going through the motions. Just kind of going to church and just thinking that's, that's what I was supposed to be doing. Checking boxes, showing up. But I haven't been empowered to, to live out this God-given call. I want that, Pastor, I wanna do that. I'm gonna ask you to come and maybe just an act, in an act of kneeling and, and praying, you're just gonna recommit yourself to God and say, God, I'm gonna start bending my ear to your voice. I'm gonna start spending time to hear your directions. I don't wanna waste my life. That's maybe the call. I wanna make an impact. The other challenge, if you are here today and you're saying, man, I wanna, 
I want to follow my God-given calling, but I don't know the God who calls me in the first place. <laughs> you got to know the God who calls in order to fulfill the God-given calling. And so I'm going to invite you today just to surrender your life as we pray completely to God and watch God work in your life to show you what he created you to do. Father, we thank you so much. With all our heads bowed and our eyes closed, God, we're going to ask right now that you show us how you created us and the purpose you created us for. God, as people feel led to come and just recommit to you, whether they do it now or doing the worship, I just pray, God, that we not waste our lives, that we make the most of the life we have, knowing that everything in life, both good and bad, are used in the tapestry of your handiwork for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name.